Last week, our new Secretary of Transportation was sworn in, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg. When we think of the U.S. Department of Transportation, we think of planes, trains, and automobiles, the interstate highway system. What can USDOT do when it comes to local transportation at the city level, especially in a place like New York City? Well, that's exactly the right question, right? Because local government is actually where the need is in transportation. So transportation is now the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, but the biggest chunk of that is private cars. And you know, similarly, when you think about transportation inequity or inequality, so much of it is about people who can't get what they need in their own neighborhood, in their own city, in their own region. So it's really like transportation is this national issue, but it's also like millions of local issues that we have to address. And so the DOT could do things like rewrite standards on road design so that we're not, you know, baking in car dependency into the street. It can rewrite grant programs so that the investments it funds are more about connecting people to places. Um, and, you know, we actually have to start requiring, you know, cities and states to measure things like transportation greenhouse gases, what you can reach on the public transportation system, safety. Let's like the federal transportation program has always been about building things and not about why we are building those things. So USDOT can change that. One of the things that I think is really exciting is not just that uh, Secretary Pete is a mayor or that the number two official is Polly Trottenberg from New York. There's so many people with local backgrounds, people who have lowered the speed limit in their cities, who've changed public process. That's a really new perspective at the DOT. When you're talking about something like these policy changes, one thing I keep hearing about is something called the 80-20 rule. Can you explain what that is and how that could be really transformative? Yeah, so that's this, basically this rule of thumb that, you know, for decades now, four-fifths of federal transportation funding goes to road programs and one-fifth to transit. And I mean, look, the interstate highway system was done decades ago, and the federal program has just been on autopilot since then. So it's really time for a change. And if we were to change that, if you were just to raise up transit funding up to where roadways are, like that actually means you're quadrupling transit funding. And that gives you the power to do things like expand bus service across the country, to fix this $100 billion repair backlog that big city transit agencies have, uh, and to build a whole lot more transit in cities and towns that deserve it and don't have it. Um, you know, in New York, well, I mean, look, we're still gonna have to clean up our own house on things like the high cost of construction projects, but this would be a huge shot in the arm for things like making the subway accessible and like getting to a basic level of modernization and state of good repair. It would make a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, just alone to, to be able to fund something like elevators, you know, that would be, that. that's exactly the, the disparity you're talking about. You've written an amazing book, Better Buses, Better Cities, about the importance of buses, not just as a climate solution, as a tool to help move people around affordably, safely, all, everything we've been talking about today. Um, the 14th Street Busway, for example, in New York is one of the best success stories, I feel like. So what could US do, DOT, which again, we're doing that shift from infrastructure into things like service. What could, what could US DOT do to boost buses nationally? Boy, I love the 14th Street Busway. As you know, now the, you know, the Flushing Busway in downtown Brooklyn, this is a trend that we've got to see in, in more places. You know, the, I think what that really tells you, almost everything that matters when it comes to bus service, it really has a low financial cost, but we don't politically prioritize it. And that's because bus improvements help marginalized people. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to do things that provide like a basic level of dignity and effectiveness, things like bus shelters, sidewalks, schedule information, replacing car lanes with bus lanes, you know, all of this stuff is cheap. I think what DOT can do is start to try to change the political incentives around buses. You know, if, um, if local officials feel like they're not gonna get credit, I mean, DOT can celebrate the places that are already doing things like doing a great job of building bus shelters or redrawing bus networks. Or if you rewrite some of the grant programs, the relatively small amount of money that DOT controls can go a long way. Like there's this program called the BUILD program, which is a really flexible program. It's about a billion dollars a year. Uh, during the Trump administration, it basically went to fund like rural highway projects. 
But if that was directed towards, you know, equitable growth, I mean, a billion dollars can get you hundreds and hundreds of bus projects in cities all over the place. It can really go a long way. Something else you and I have talked about before is how critical getting these operational dollars are to these local transit agencies as we start to recover from the pandemic. And cities, I think they recently just announced the next round of uh, finalized dollars for federal relief. But how do you sustain that recovery and how do you keep funding transit as we as we exit this great time of you know horrible financial upheaval? So the U.S. government used to provide regular funding to keep transit service running, operating support, you know, running service, not just building projects. That started to end under Reagan and it was kind of snuffed out for good during the Clinton administration. But the coronavirus relief bills have brought that back in a big way. And I think, you know, we got to ask ourselves, you know, is this just going to be the sort of one-time emergency funding or are we going to make it a yearly standard again? If we did that, you know, not only would we get cities through the pandemic, but we would make it possible for transit to really, you know, build itself back stronger. Um, the Urban Institute, uh, you know, think tank in DC found that uh, if you just have $17 billion a year in funding, which you can do if you have that 50-50 split, mm -hmm. you can give every region in the country the same amount of transit per capita as in the Chicago region. That's a big leap for a lot of places. You know, that would be about 40% more service than the average place. So that's, I mean, that goes a long way towards, you know, not having to plan your life around the schedule. Um, and then I think in New York, you know, we got to get congestion pricing back on track. Um, that's good public policy. I mean, not only is it going to fund transit, but it'll make the city uh, a safer, more livable place. Yeah, and, and that is something that he could actually do. That's something that we do need help from Secretary Pete to, to sign that little piece of paper that, that makes mm -hmm. it possible. What else would you say are some of your priorities for Secretary Pete? Uh, I think there's so much that the DOT can do to support equity in transportation planning. Look, transportation agencies are supposed to, you know, they're supposed to be barred from changing service in ways that discriminate. There are all these protections that come from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but in transportation, the regulations are basically toothless. And so we can do a lot to demand agencies do more. We have to be asking some basic questions like, how well does the transportation system get people to jobs and to parks and to grocery stores? And what is the racial access gap and what our agencies plan to close that gap. You know, that has to be the basis of planning going forward. And, it, you know, we have all the data we need to do it. If agencies actually had to target investments that way, you know, you would see a lot more transit in the U.S. too, because it's such a big part of closing that gap and saying that actually does that everyone deserves to be able to access what they need.